Good morning, church. Oh, gosh. Are we tired? Good morning, church. I invite you all to stand and let us get started with our worship service. Thank you. 
heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here with expectant hearts seeking your blessings upon this service. May your favor rest upon us as we sing, as we pray and study your word. May we leave here today knowing your presence is with us. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let me invite our kids down and everyone else can be seated. I want to welcome you to Lakeshore Church this morning on this uh, festive celebration day. We're celebrating uh, Palm Sunday, and uh, if you don't know what that is, by the end of the service, you'll, you'll have a, an idea and a thought. If, if you're visiting today, we're so glad to have you, so glad to count you a part of our worshiping church. We're glad that you're here. We invite you to stay after the service, too, for coffee and fellowship, a chance to get to know one another a little bit better. Thanks to those joining online. If you're in the chat, just let us know you're here and uh, say hi uh, for us. Good morning. You've already found my, uh, my little toy here, Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been a part of a parade? You ever you ever seen a parade? I think I know a big parade. You know about a parade? You've, your friend has been in a parade? Yeah? You guys hanging out back there, huh? That's a good Yeah. My friend's going to a parade. I have a devil parade, but it has nothing to do with the devil. Okay, your friend's in a parade and going to it. Okay, very good, very nice. So uh, one of the things that we're celebrating today is a parade that, uh, that just kind of came together for Jesus. It's talked about in the Bible, and it happened on this uh, day that we call Palm Sunday. Anybody know what Jesus uh, rode into the city of Jerusalem in that led the parade? He was on, a, he was on an animal. Like this animal? Kind of like this animal here. But what, it's not what, Gabrielle, do you know what animal it was? No. It was a donkey, yeah. This, this, I think, is a horse, but it's a small little horse, and that's what a donkey is, a small little horse. I think it looks like a unicorn. No, maybe a unicorn, yeah. But Jesus walked in on a donkey, or rode in on a donkey. And as he was riding in, uh, that's why we have these palms, uh, people were shouting, Hosanna! Did you, were you guys here when we, we, we were, Hosanna, when we were singing it, just a little bit ago. Do you guys know what that word Hosanna means? No. It's a praise to Jesus. It's, it's, telling, it's praising Jesus for uh, him being a very special king. And they were saying Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, I was thinking maybe we could like do a little impromptu parade. You guys want to do that with me? Yeah? Okay, we got to stand up for it. And for this, everyone needs a, a palm. Who needs a palm? Here. Is that, is that the onion from How Can I Make It? Here. Here. And we, and we got palms here, too. We got palms. Uh, and they're on the floor. Grab, just grab one off the floor. See, the, when Jesus was coming in, they were laying palms before him, so anyone could just pick up a palm. And the onion from How Can I Make It? Yeah. Who's going who's gonna to be the lead? We need... We need 
Whoa, you guys like to be the lead, huh, in the parade? Uh, all right, all right, you want to be the, we need two leads to hold the donkey, one on each side. Jaden, you want to be one? All right, okay, we, we can be one here, uh, Ruby, here. Okay, now Jaden, you hold this, Ruby, you hold this one. Okay, you're picking up, now you're in front, and just, can you guys pick it up? Katie, maybe you can pluck up the back there, and you want to be a part of it. There you go. Okay, so you're walking forward. We don't have Jesus, but he's part of this, too. We know he's here. Okay, so when, when I say Hosanna, you guys just say Hosanna. What does it mean? Hosanna. Hosanna. It, it does mean save us. Yeah, it's a praise to Jesus. So we're going to come. We're doing a parade, and we're going to need everyone's help, too, to, to shout the hosannas, wave their palm branches. So when I say hosanna, you guys say hosanna. Hosanna! hosanna. Okay, keep walking. Parades are always moving forward. We're not stopping. All right. Hosanna! hosanna. Okay, I'm going to say some other things. After I say them, you can say hosanna. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the king. Hosanna. All right, keep coming. <laughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. All right, Hosanna. Hosanna. All right. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king. <laughs> Hosanna. <laughs> Okay, 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 time out. That's good, guys. You can set, you can set uh, Jesus down. Set, set Jesus down. Okay, so, so just as they were, you can just hold it right there. Just like they were celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, we, we celebrate, too, how God is in our midst and how Jesus continues to love and save us uh, even today. Okay, um, you guys want to go back to the front? We can, well, let's leave Jesus in the city. We'll leave him here. All right. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. That was a lot of fun. We had fun. I had fun. All right, so you guys can hold on to these palms, okay? They're, they're, part, of the, they're part of the celebration today. And it's so, this, just a way that we can remember what happened on this, this day, a great moment of celebration. And it happened right before uh, Jesus got into trouble and he was arrested and he died. That comes later in the week. But today is a day to celebrate that Jesus is our king. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for moments of celebration, and sometimes they just happen unexpectedly, like it did on Palm Sunday. We ask that we might always know your presence in our lives, uh, especially when joy comes to us in unexpected ways. Amen. All right, let's stand up, and we're going to do our blessing. You guys remember the blessing? All right, you guys say, and also with you, after the congregation uh, offers uh, the blessing. So church, will you offer the blessing? May the love of Jesus Christ be with you. Also with you. All right. We are, over the next couple of weeks, collecting a special uh, denominational offering. It's called the One Great Hour of Sharing Offering. We have a quick video uh, that uh, shares a little bit more uh, about what that offering is and what it's about. We're going to collect the offering later in the service and over the next couple of weeks. We want you to find more information about it. You also got a little flyer about it on the way in this morning. God calls us through the prophet Isaiah to be repairers of the breach, to heal the world's and our own brokenness. One Great Hour of Sharing helps us live into the prophet's call by addressing the world's hurts and injustices. Through One Great Hour of Sharing, self-development of people partners with Caridad Gardens in Las Vegas to offer critical support to homeless people. 
The Presbyterian Hunger Program works with Kasupe Ministries Women's Bakery and Value Addition Center in Malawi to address the food shortage in the Kasupe region by having women produce and sell a variety of baked goods and farm products. In Syria and Turkey, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance joins hands with the Middle East Council of Churches to address the humanitarian and economic crisis created by years of war and a devastating earthquake. It has been said that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Generous giving that can transform our prayers into action goes a long way to transform that fear into hope. Our gifts bring shelter in the face of natural disaster, provide economic support in the face of poverty, and supply food in the face of hunger. In a broken and fearful world, we will, by God's grace, be led into a new season of justice, freedom, and peace for God's people. Let's do our part by giving what we can, for when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. Help us to delight in you, O God, that we might become agents of healing and hope, repair and restoration. Transform our brokenness and fear into justice and mercy, and bless our work to share your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. consider a, a special gift or donation uh, here for the season. The impact uh, goes uh, global. Uh, just when you give, make sure you just put it in the designated envelope or, or make a note of it or mark it in some way. Uh, as we uh, prepare to continue to celebrate this Palm Sunday, I want to point us to how the, the celebration as Jesus was coming in was an unexpected celebration uh, for the disciples. And I have an honest question for us all to consider as we begin worship today. Is, is there a time that you can remember when you unexpectedly celebrated? Maybe someone threw a surprise party for you or is the expected uh, success uh, in your life, or, or maybe it was just a moment of joy in the midst of an otherwise difficult uh, time and period in your life. Uh, God is working in the midst of the unexpected, and as you reflect on a specific memory or a time when you came into unexpected celebration, we, we, we can point to all sorts of ways or times that that this happens in our lives. Uh, uh, maybe you received an unexpected uh, sort of blessing uh, that you weren't anticipated. An act of kindness was given or shown to you and it was by a friend and it was a complete surprise. Or maybe you just got awestruck by uh, nature's beauty. Or maybe you've been praying really hard for something and then there was a breakthrough. You weren't even expecting it even more anymore even as you were praying for it. Just get in touch with maybe uh, a time uh, like that and turn to God with me in prayer. Lord God, we uh, just acknowledge that joy sometimes comes in our lives unexpectedly and surprisingly. We're not, we're not, we're not always ready for the way that you are bringing blessing into our lives. And, and we confess that, Lord, that we, we aren't expecting uh, you to move. We aren't expecting you to act. We aren't expecting uh, God-inspired joy. But we ask that you tune us into the reality of your loving presence, that you are at work, that we might even be able to see it in the midst of difficult and trying cir circumstances. Lord, tune our hearts to you this morning. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. This is the word of the Lord. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his, dis his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and that they had done these things to him. This is the word of the Lord.
invite you all to stand. Just walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see.
draws near, then my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise on that day. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Him. You may be seated. I looked up and he was there. Just right there. Scared us at first. But then again at this point, why were we so surprised? I guess that kind of tells you how frustrating we were to him at times. We'd seen him do so many things. Miracles. Why did we act so shocked? I asked him if I could walk to him. And when did he ever say no to us? Never. Not once. And so I got out of that boat, just hopped out of it like we were on land or something. and I felt the wind, it uh, felt like it just went straight through me. All my confidence just slipped out of the bottom of my feet. You should have heard them when he rode into Jerusalem. I can still hear them. Hundreds just lining the streets, chanting it over and over and over and over and over and over. Hosanna in the highest. Salvation has come. And they finally felt it. They finally celebrated him. And I... I already knew him. I knew he is the kind of king who reaches out and pulls you up, even if you have doubts. The one who always comes to help us. The one who always saves you when you call his name. Hosanna. Hosanna. Thank you. I, I love Palm Sunday. It's just such a festive and joyous time. We're, we're still in Lent. It's, it, it's, it's like a little reprieve from Lent right before we go into the week of Jesus' trouble, his suffering, persecution, and death. But it's a special Sunday every year. Even during the pandemic, it was special. Uh, still a Sunday of celebration. I was excited about it. We still got the palms in, but church was closed that year, of course. We tried to give palms out, drive through palms to whoever wanted them. And I still remember Palm Sunday. I was sitting on my couch, gathering my family on the couch, and then, you know, watching me on TV deliver this 
awesome sermon for Palm Sunday. And I, I wanted all my kids to be captivated. Of course, the eldest was three years old, so they weren't so interested in what daddy was saying on the TV. Not so interested in what daddy was saying on the couch either when I was like, kid, I got it out. Come sit down. They, they got into a fight and the uh, whole Palm Sunday was almost ruined when I said, all right, everyone outside. And we had our palms and we ended up doing this impromptu parade through the neighborhood, you know, and they were shouting as loud as they could, Hosanna, Hosanna, and I were doing impromptu cheers back and forth as we're trying to do here today with the kids. And now, if this was like the movies, you know, the whole neighborhood would have come out and we would have had a joyous parade, uh, but it's real life, so it was just us, <laughs> although some of the neighbors were, uh, you know, peeking out their windows. <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> One neighbor was cheering for us. They knew what we were doing. Uh, the disciples experienced this very impromptu parade on that first Palm Sunday. They weren't expecting it. They, they didn't plan for it. It just kind of happened. And, and it caught them by surprise. They didn't even know if they would be in Jerusalem for the festival. Of course, they weren't celebrating Palm Sunday. What they were celebrating was the Passover, the Jewish celebration of how God had delivered the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt into the, into the promised land. As they uh, were celebrating that in Jerusalem every year, it was a huge festival, but the disciples didn't know if they were going to be a part of it that year. Why? Because they were on the run. It wasn't too long before this that Jesus had got to the city of Bethany and had come to the tomb where his friend Lazarus lay. Lazarus had been dead for a couple days. And he just stands in front of that tomb. Jesus says, come out! And Lazarus just walks on out. Uh, he, the body had been de decomposing for a couple of days. He walks out alive as if he had never died. And people saw this. And, and he had already you know, been gaining in popularity, but you can imagine how this would just kind of explode the news about Jesus, which freaked the religious leaders out. They became so afraid and what were they afraid of? They were afraid that you know, all of this, this movement and momentum and, and uh, celebration of Jesus uh, was going to get the attention of Rome, that Rome would think, well, we can't let this happen, and they'd come in and quash it with military might, maybe even come into the temple and occupy it, kick the leaders, the Jewish leaders out, and that wouldn't have been good for them. It wouldn't have been good for the whole nation of Israel, and so they devised a plan. And that's when they began to plot to kill Jesus. This is why Jesus and the disciples fled. And they disappeared. They ended up in a city about 15 miles outside of Jerusalem. Actually pretty far when the main mode of transportation was walking. And also uh, a, a secret place. Nobody knew where they were. They were holed up. No one knew where they were or where they went. And it was during this time the disciples said, I don't know if we're going to do you know, Passover in Jerusalem this year. But as that day got closer, Jesus was on the move again. And to the disciples' surprise, he goes right back to Bethany. That's where Lazarus lives. They had a meal together, Lazarus and his sisters and Jesus. And uh, Bethany's just two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's, it's not in the city, but it's like part of the city. It's like the suburbs of, of Jerusalem. And as soon as they're there and eating with Lazarus, you know, People notice and they see him and words spread. And, and this probably happening on a Friday night and then the Sabbath came and then the next morning, Sunday morning, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and by this time, word had gotten out and the streets are lined with people and this is when they're waving their palm branches as Jesus rides in on this donkey and the disciples are just caught off guard. This wasn't something they planned. There was nothing that any of them was controlling. It was just happening and they were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna, which, which does mean, you know, save us. It's a proclamation of praise for Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. This is a courageous and a subversive statement that this crowd is making. If, you know, Caesar got a hold of this, all the fears of the religious leadership uh, could have come true. 
So all this is a surprise to, to the disciples. They're, they're surprised because really they thought you know, one of two things was going to happen for them on the way into Jerusalem. I'm speculating here because we don't know really what they were thinking, but uh, I said they, they were either thinking, A, that they'd be able to slip into the city quietly, go unnoticed, have their little celebration, or B, they would get noticed and Jesus would get arrested. But, but here, he, there, it's such a big and festive thing. The religious leaders are there, but Jesus' popularity is in a way protecting him from his arrest here in this moment. Disciples are confused. They don't fully understand or comprehend what's happening. And we know that for certain because the gospel writer, John, actually says that. Says the disciples did not understand. Only after Jesus was glorified did they understand. Which means they don't understand right here in that moment, but they later come to understand. And I don't blame the disciples for not getting the greater significance here because so many times in my life, you know, God is working in, in the present moment in the details of my life and I can't see it. In the unexpected moments of life, God is writing a story of redemption that may only be read in hindsight. Now, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know we've been following Peter's story. And, and that was Peter in the video. We talked about that moment of rescue when he was coming out on the sea. We talked about Peter and his wandering faith. And, and as we've been talking about Peter, it's, it's because we're looking at the story of Jesus through Peter's eyes and we acknowledge our own wandering faith because there's moments when Jesus gets it right, I mean, when Peter gets it right and he's on top of the, the world. There's moments when he gets Jesus wrong and he makes these foolhardy decisions. We've seen how Peter leans into the mystery of the God who is in Jesus Christ, how he's learning from the master teacher. There was that one Sunday where we talked about after he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus then begins talking about his death, his persecution, his suffering, and that's when Peter pulls him aside and says, no, 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 Jesus, that's not the plan. That's not God's plan for the Messiah. And that's when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's this huge rebuke, and, and Peter had been understanding that the whole time. And I, I just kind of wondering in this moment, because this passage doesn't tell us specifically about Peter, but he was there. He was there for the whole thing as all the disciples were. And I just kind of imagine him thinking, you know, back to that, 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 that moment and seeing, maybe he was right. Like saying, Jesus, I told you so. I, I told you the people were going to you know, rise up and see that you're the king and the Messiah and all the people are seeing that and they're proclaiming this. And, and we talked about how during this time there was a, 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 a Jewish nationalistic uh, expectation for the Messiah. That, that the Messiah, the chosen one of God, would come and establish a kingdom on earth, a kingdom like King David when Israel was sovereign and, and, and Israel was at the height of its uh, political and military power. Uh, they, they felt like, you know, the Messiah w would, would do this, um, uh, would do this again. But Peter could be saying right here in this moment, ah, see, Jesus, I told you so. Look at these people. But then he remembers, too, what Jesus said, so it's just a moment of confusion because he doesn't understand exactly what Jesus is doing in this moment. He doesn't see how Jesus is working in the details of the moment. And what Jesus is doing here is he's pulling from the past, looking to the future, and bringing past, present, and future together in this moment. And specifically what they aren't seeing, the disciples, is how Jesus is pulling on a prophecy from Zechariah. Zechariah was a prophet who lived 500 years before this. He was a prophet during the time of Israel's restoration. After a period of exile, when they were banished from their uh, home territory, they were coming back, and the people are coming back together. They're rebuilding the temple. And he was offering a, a prophecy of hope. And that's when he said, you know, you know do not be afraid 
daughters of Zion, which is a poetic way of saying, you know, all you people, all you inhabitants of Jerusalem, don't be afraid, you are in God's care. And then Zechariah said, see, your king comes on a donkey. Now, he wasn't predicting what Jesus was doing here. He was speaking into his own cultural context. But th there's a, a symbolic significance to a king riding into a city on a donkey. And, and the symbolism is that the king is, is reigning with humility and peace and bringing salvation to the people. Now, the way that they perceived Jesus was going to do this as they were shouting Hosanna was that he was going to... Uh, conquer their occupiers, and then establish a reign of humility, peace, and salvation. But what Jesus is actually doing is he's already reigning, and he's reigning through humility, peace, and through these things over the course of the week, it's going to bring salvation to the whole world. And of course, the disciples couldn't see that in that moment. They didn't appreciate how the week was going to uh, pan out and all that God's plan was for this. But Jesus worked that detail so they could see it when they looked back on this moment. It's, it's not here in the Gospel of John, but all four Gospels talk about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And if you look at the other Gospels, they're they're a little bit bigger of a story. And the reason the other Gospels tell a bigger part of the story is because they speak about the intentionality that Jesus has in securing this donkey. The disciples didn't know anything about it, but Jesus had planned meticulously where he was going to get this donkey, how he was going to get this donkey. He sent the disciples to do the errand, but they didn't understand what they were doing. It seems silly to everyone in the moment, but this is the detail that, that Jesus was orchestrating when he got himself that donkey. It, only in hindsight were they able to see what Jesus was up to. You know, it's kind of why I love when we come together on Sunday mornings, because, you know, I've made plans for this service, Pastor Brennan has made plans, our uh, band uh, has made plans, our volunteers and leaders have made plans to put together, hear what we do on Sunday morning, but then it all comes together and God begins to work his own details in ways that we weren't planning, in ways that we weren't appreciating. And I don't usually see that on any given Sunday morning, very rarely. But sometimes in hindsight, you can go back and see it. You know, last week I was preaching about forgiveness and, and the Spirit was moving and convicting people. And uh, later in the week, one of the persons who was convicted was still convicted and it caused them to pick up the phone and talk to a long lost loved one of theirs. And that relationship this week, I just heard, is blossoming in a new way, a, a relationship that had been completely silent for over a decade. You know, in, 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 in these moments, in unexpected moments, God is writing his story of redemption, and we may only be able to read it in hindsight. I think as people get older, you have a better ability to see God in the details from earlier in your life, it's maybe just the gift of time and the gift that you have more hindsight to look back on when you're older. But I can testify to that. If you want to sit down, I can tell you the specific story. Stories about when, you know, God was closing doors on me and I, I didn't want those doors closed. I'd pray, God, don't close those doors on me. He slammed them shut in my face. And all the while, he was also opening up these other little doors for me. And I didn't want those doors open. I didn't know that they were going to be significant in my life, but there they were, open and you know, walk through it. And I don't know if we have any uh, country music fans here, like old school country music fans. I, it's kind of a cliche, but I couldn't help but think about that song. Not that old school. I'm a child of the 80s. But I'm talking about Garth Brooks, his song, sometimes uh, God's Greatest Gifts Are Unanswered Prayers. Anybody know that song? Uh, Corey Tenboom. Uh, was able to see God's working in the details of her life as she looked back on her life. Corey Ten Boon, uh, just a little bit older than, than I am when uh, the Nazis invaded her, her home, hometown. 
She was a Dutch Christian, a wonderful Christian uh, woman, a watchmaker by trade. That was the family business. She was prominent in the city. She, she had a heart for Christian service, serving you know, the, those who needed food and shelter and clothing. She also set up a, a, a youth club, a youth club specifically for teenage girls, where she you know, offered Christian instruction and all these other things. Well, the Nazis came in. They shut down that youth club uh, right away, but that didn't stop her or her family from serving. And, and People in the town knew their heart, and this Jewish family showed up, and they ended up sheltering uh, this family. And that ballooned into something much bigger. They became part of the uh, Dutch underground resistance network. They even uh, constructed this room in their It was a secret room, and they had a fake wall and everything that, that they housed Jewish families and people in who were needing a shelter. In total, this specific family saved 800 Jewish lives. And her father was the one who said, you know, all of God's people are welcome here in my house. And he had a very expansive view of that. He wasn't just talking about, you know, followers of Jesus, but he, when he said that, he was talking specifically uh, about uh, Jews. Now, Nazis got wind of the family and, and came into the house arrested the whole family, ransacked the house. They never found that secret room. There was a Jewish family in that room when this family got arrested, and they ended up being fine. A few days later, they were able to escape. But Corey uh, Ten Boom writes about all of her horrific experiences as well as the horrific things that she witnessed in her book that she wrote in 1971. It was called The Hiding Place. And the amazing thing about her autobiography is how she is able to point to the way that God was working, both in moments of, uh, moments of joy, uh, but also in moments of great difficulty and darkness. Specifically, she talked about how she and her sister ended up in a concentration camp, and they were in these barracks that were just infested with fleas. And, and she and her sister complained about those fleas because they, they were terrible. It was like throughout the whole uh, barracks. But in hindsight, she realized that the fleas actually kept the guards away. The guards never really checked on them because of that, and she was able to lead these Bible studies with the other people who were tra trapped in that particular residence, and there were many people who actually converted to Christianity because of that. She also pointed to a clerical error that was made at this time, and she couldn't understand why or how that happened, but in hindsight, and only in hindsight, because she had no idea at the time, she, she, she could see how God was part of that timing, because she was released, and if she hadn't been released in, in that moment, within the week, she would have ended up in the gas chambers. In the unexpected moments of life, God is writing his story of redemption that we may only read in hindsight. I don't know what's going on you know, in your life right now. Maybe you hit a, hit a moment of, of difficulty and hardship. Or, or maybe, maybe you're just looking at the world today and you say, man, our world is heading in the wrong direction. And you just, you know, you begin to wonder, you know, is God abandoning us? Where, where is uh, the Lord? But we can, we can trust that even if we can't see how God is at work, God is at work. And that doesn't mean everything that happens is, you know, part of God's plan. I mean, there's horrific things that are happening that God doesn't want. But God is at work even in the midst of dark times and dark moments. That's why the Apostle Paul, you know, later writes... In his letter, he says, to give thanks to God in any and all circumstances. And that doesn't mean every circumstance uh, is, is something that you want to give thanks to God for, but even in the midst of those circumstances, you can give thanks to God. Because he's working, even if you don't know it, how? You know, he's, wor he, he's working. He's working his story of redemption. I invite you here in, the, in this week ahead just to maybe reflect back on different moments or times in your life. Uh, maybe there are moments of, of great joy or maybe there are moments of hardship. Just see if you can look back. Uh, think about how maybe God was orchestrating something greater than what you could know or see or experience in that moment. Maybe you're beginning to be able to see that now. 
I had that very experience here in this week because leading into this particular Sunday, you know, I wanted to kind of prep my own kids for Palm Sunday, get them in the spirit and the festivity and the celebration. And I was talking to them uh, about uh, Palm Sunday. And just like as soon as I start, uh, one of them says to me, Daddy, we already know about Palm Sunday. And then he goes on and tells me all about Palm Sunday. I'm thinking, I never told you anything like that. I mean, how do you know any of that stuff? And My eldest said, Daddy, don't you remember the parade? And she was only three years old when we did that. That was probably one of her earliest memories. And it was a moment of frustration for me. I was at my wit's end. But but then God worked in the middle of that in ways that I only appreciated here this week. You know, building a a foundation that my eldest were then teaching Palm Sunday to her two younger brothers. (laughs) And creating a memory for that moment that's now going to last a lifetime, you know, even beyond my lifetime. You know, in unexpected moments, God is writing his story of salvation. We may only be able to read it in hindsight. So trust in, these, in, in this work of our Lord Jesus and celebrate both the things we know and the things we don't know. And praise and glory be God's. Amen. I'm going to let you sit with this for a few moments and we are going to collect an offering in just a little bit. And uh, as we collect an offering, if you're visiting today, we do three things during the offering time. One is that we uh, let our presence be an offering to the Lord. And on the yellow card, you can uh, you know, let us know you've been here. You can also check in through the Lakeshore Church app. You can download that if you haven't, or through the QR code. Just let us know you've been here. Uh, we like to keep track of who's, who's with us, especially if you're visiting with us. We would love to be in touch with you uh, here in the week, weeks ahead. We uh, also invite you to share your prayer concerns and joys, things that you're experiencing in your life or that you want prayed for that are going on in the world. Just write those on the blue prayer cards that's in the uh, pew rack. Uh, Write them down. You can put those in the offering pray, and we'll be able to pray for those in just a little bit. Uh, We are collecting our our, our regular offering as well as uh, the one great hour of sharing uh, offering. Your gifts do make a difference and an impact I was remembering, speaking about how God works in ways that we don't always appreciate in the moment. Ten years ago, in Metro Detroit, there was uh, torrential downpours and rain, and it caused actually great damage throughout Metro Detroit and our city, and it damaged our church. A basement came completely flooded with uh, sewage, water, and you know, it was $50,000 worth of damage, but that turned into a $100,000 um, uh, renovation. And we actually got a grant. It was a small grant. It was only $5,000, but it was a grant from the One Great Hour Sharing Offering. And, and they gave us, helped to give us a vision to actually turn our basement and, and into um, a mission host site. And so we now have the ability, and we do every year, host mission teams from out of sight who come and then work in our city. And I remember it was the year after all this happened, there was a mission team from out of state who came in and stayed with us. They could because of the showers that we had uh, put in. And they went out to work. It was a a disabled uh, elderly gentleman's home. It was a year later, but he had done nothing after the flooding in his basement. The water had all receded, but you can imagine the mold and the smell that was down in his basement. It was coming up into the house. That mission team got in there. Uh, They didn't renovate the basement, but they completely gutted it and and removed the the, the mold and the sickness and the, the things that would have caused illness. He was just so grateful for this team's work. And it's just a small story of how God is, makes an impact uh, through your financial support, uh, both to this ministry as well as to the one great hour of sharing. It was both a local and a global reach. Will you pray with me? 
God, we do give you thanks for how you uh, work in unexpected ways. And Lord, as uh, we bring money together over the next few weeks for this special offering for our denomination, we can't even anticipate the way that you might begin to use that money. We only know how you've used the money in the past, and we give you thanks and praise for how it's brought hope into people's lives, people who have found themselves in desperate uh, situations. Lord, I ask that you take and use our gifts that we're bringing here today and, and use our whole selves as we, as we turn our lives over to you, Lord. We ask that you help us to see, not right now, but, but later, just how you've been using and how you're, you're, you're working to, to bring your glory into the world that all might know and sing the loudest praise. Hosanna, you are King and Lord. We say this in Christ's name. Amen.
Hosanna in the highest. You may be seated. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I would like to offer up some of our joys and our concerns this morning. First, I have some concerns. Um, let's see, from Marilyn Romance. Prayers for my sister, Marianne, who has been battling to walk again after being rear-ended 10 years ago in a car accident. My friend Jackie's husband, Jason, is struggling with his faith and belief in God from Michelle Maxout. Prayers for Nick LaFleur, who is in the hospital. Please pray for our mom, Elda. She's hospitalized. Andrea and Ramada. And then we also want to pray for John Beck, his health and his healing at this time. And so together, let us lift up our concerns and we say, Lord, hear our prayer. We want to lift up our joys this morning. The, the flowers were given on behalf of the Hewn sisters um, in memory of Mother Mary Hewn on the anniversary of her birth. And also from Denise Rice in loving memory of husband John and sister Betsy on the anniversary of their births. Um, we also want, we have a joy praise for my wonderful daughter-in-law, em Emily, in honor of her birthday and all she means to our family. Amen. Um, thank you for reminding me to remember that God can work in unexpected ways. Not always in the way I expect him to, and all of it is out of his love for us, from Andrea. Amen. Um, thanks be to God for my new job and knowing what we need, even if it isn't exactly what we want, Nisha. And together we lift up our joys. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, thank you for saving us. Every bit of the universe you care for, you are looking after every person and animal, everything that cries out to you, every person who is struggling, who is in need. For those who are singing hosannas today, who are rejoicing, who are giving you all the praise and glory, Lord, may they also spread that to others who are in need at this time whether that's through their physical needs or psychological needs or social needs, Lord, let those who have received your gift not just hold it for themselves, but offer it up as a sacrifice to you. Let them extend the mercy that this world so much needs right now. And we, we know that um, others can receive it because we received it from you. And we just give you thanks and praise today. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, as we enter into Holy Week, remind us, hold us as we remember our loved ones that we've lost. As we go forward with your good news, teach us in new ways, in refreshing ways, in unexpected ways, in ordinary ways. And Lord, we learn from you as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. stand
Done our chance to get to know one another a little bit better. Uh, we've been celebrating today. Next week we're celebrating Easter Sunday, the resurrection, but in between there's a lot of darkness. So I want to invite you to come out this Thursday. We're celebrating uh, what's called Monday Thursday, we're celebrating communion, Jesus' Last Supper. And then on Friday, uh, Good Friday, we'll remember the crucifixion. Uh, they say that the number one reason that a person visits a church for the first time is because someone invited them. I want to think and invite you to invite someone in your life to church with you, uh, either during the week or especially next day. My friends, we've been the body of Christ gathered here for worship. Now we're the body of Christ sent out into the world. So let us go with God and his blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore. Amen.
wonderful week and we'll see you Maundy Thursday, Good Friday or Easter Sunday or all the above.